Ladies and gentlemen, we might make a start. Firstly, welcome to tonight's Perspective Asia lecture. And we're looking at Japan from Heisei to Reiwa. My name, for any of, the, of you who don't know me, is Caitlin Byrne. I'm the director of the Griffith Asia Institute. And in welcoming you here tonight, it's my great pleasure, firstly, in the spirit of reconciliation, to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, the Turrbal and Yagara people. And I extend my respects to leaders past, present and emerging. And I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I must say, it was a little bit of a cool night tonight. So I was worried. You know how we are sometimes in Brisbane. Um, it can mean that people won't turn up to an event. But look at this full house. It's absolutely fantastic and really fabulous to see you here tonight weathering the cool. Um, in particular, I'd like to acknowledge a couple of very special people. Firstly, Consul General Mr Kazunari Tanaka, Consulate General from Japan. The Deputy Consul General, Mr Takeshi Tanabe, from the Consulate General of Japan in Brisbane as well. Mr Casper Cooper, Consulate of the Netherlands in Brisbane. Mr Dario Morosini, Deputy State Director of the Queensland State Office, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Mr Chris Saines, Director, Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art. Uh, I know there are many more special people in the audience and to all of you, welcome. So tonight is our third in the Perspectives Asia series for 2019. It's actually the 15th year of partnership between the Griffith Asia Institute and the Australian Centre for Asia Pacific Art from the Queensland Art Gallery and Gallery of Modern Art. Through these lectures, the Perspectives Asia series, we really try and explore contemporary issues, whether they relate to culture, politics, society, the environment, all of the issues of significance that really drive Australia's engagement in our neighbourhood, the Asia Pacific region. So we're really privileged tonight uh, to be speaking about an event that holds some significance for us in the region. Many of you I know will have been watching the various sort of electoral issues right across the region from our own Australian national election, uh, Indonesia's had its elections, India, We've really seen a fair bit of tumult and, and uh, debate and discussion right across the region. One particular transition that has occurred that holds particular significance and took place probably without the kind of chaos that we tend to see in those electoral processes was the imperial transition that took place at the end of last month in Japan and which moved us from the Heisei to the Reiwa era. That in itself is significant and for a region or for a country like Japan that is so deeply um, embedded in ritual and tradition, it was fascinating and I think captured the imagination of many people just watching these traditional rituals and cultural practices unfold. It's a big change but at the same time quite possibly not much has changed. And I think tonight our speaker is going to take us through the nature of the imperial transition, why it's significant and important, what it means for contemporary Japan, and perhaps look at some of the other dynamics shaping contemporary Japan in our region today. So that brings me to our speaker, Bruce Miller. Bruce Miller AO was Australian ambassador to Japan from August 2011 until January 2017. He has, though, had a 40-year association with Japan. And I think you will be really um, impressed, as I have been, by the depth of his experience, his, his expertise that spans that time frame. Bruce has a Bachelor of Arts in Japanese Language, Literature and History and a Bachelor of Laws from the University of Sydney. He's occupied senior positions in the Department of Foreign Affairs, Affairs and Trade and the Office of National Assessments, including as Director General of that agency, before he left government in December 2017 to take up roles in the private sector and academia, many of which keep him connected to Japan. He became a Distinguished Policy Fellow at the ANU in September 2018 and was appointed an Officer in the Order of Australia in the 2018 Queen's Birthday Honours. Please join me in welcoming our special speaker this evening, Mr Bruce Miller. Well, 
Professor Byrne, Caitlin, thank you for the very generous introduction. Uh, here I was thinking it was such a balmy night and uh, <laughs> there'd be no excuse for anyone turning up, but of course, having spent so much of my life in Canberra and in Tokyo, I'm not quite so used to the, uh, the weather in Brisbane. Uh, look, I'd just like to begin by congratulating Griffith Asia Institute for the, the top-class contribution it makes to understanding Asia. And I also thank the Centre for the invitation to speak here this evening on the transition in Japan from Heisei to Rewa. But I also have to um, acknowledge the presence of uh, the Consul General, Kazunari Tanaka, because I've known him for 26 years. Uh, we were both... Um, uh, well, I won't say young together, but we both worked on bilateral relations back in the uh, 1993, I think, is when we first met, probably. And uh, uh, so it's terrific to see you here today and in your, your current position. I, um, I'll offer some observations on the imperial transition, but also on contemporary Japan. I'll do it in two halves. I'll speak about the imperial institution and its role, both in historical context and in the context of Japan's post-war constitutional traditions. Then, more broadly, speak a bit about the likely direction of Japan in the new era. Uh, question time, you can take me wherever you like. Uh, I no longer work for the government. <laughs> I'm a private citizen and I don't need to mind my P's and Q's. Uh, I'll be speaking from the perspective of someone, thanks to the positions that I've held over the years, who's had a, it's now 41-year association with Japan and lived there for nearly 20 years uh, in total over that period, and developed what I would call an on-the-job understanding of the country, its language, history, culture, politics and economy. It hasn't been a life spent in deep academic reflection, probably unfortunately, but rather in engaging in diplomacy, uh, pursuing Australia's national interests. So it is a particular perspective. Uh, now, seen from Australia, what does the transition mean? Views range from those arguing that it is quaint, fascinating, but perhaps meaningless. Others argue, though, that the shift in era will amount to a massive change in the Japanese psyche. Well, my answer to that question lies somewhere in between. My main argument is that the imperial institution, while deeply rooted in Japan's traditions, is an integral part of Japan's more recent but nonetheless well-entrenched democracy, and that that institution has shown flexibility as it has evolved over time. And I also argue that ultimately the new Reiwa era will reflect, will reflect modern Japan as it evolves rather than determine how it evolves. Now it's worth dwelling a little on the, the role of the emperor and perhaps to compare with other constitutional monarchs. Uh, uh, I think this, sheds, this comparison can shed some light on modern Japan. The emperor has less of a political role than other comparable constitutional monarchs or heads of state. He has no formal political powers. Unlike, for example, the queen in Britain or the governor general in Australia who have residual powers, admittedly rarely exercised to select a prime minister should there be doubt about an election outcome, the emperor has no discretion at all in the appointment of the prime minister. The prime minister is chosen by majority vote on the floor of both houses of the parliament with the lower house prevailing in the event of a disagreement. Only then, once selected, does the emperor preside over an attestation ceremony that recognises the reality that a prime minister has been chosen by the parliament. Under the post-war constitution, the emperor is explicitly the symbol of the unity of the Japanese people. Nippon kokumin togo no shoujo is literally the language from the, um, the constitution. So not particularly the head of state, but rather the symbol of the state, the symbol of the unity of the Japanese people. Uh, emperors since the war take very seriously this role of symbol. Now, Having said all that, the emperor's role as symbol isn't quite the post-war novelty that it is made out to be. And indeed, in the same way, the, the so-called um, divinity of the emperor prior to 1945 doesn't quite have the long pedigree it was supposed to have had. The modern role of symbol has been grafted onto a tradition of the emperors having almost no actual power, but a great deal of prestige that has lasted almost all of the last 1,000 years. Before that, yes, emperors did have political power, but really from the mid Heian period on, such emperors were the rare exception rather than the rule. 
So rather, rather than having political power, the institution has built on its religious functions and its cultural prestige through most of this period. Uh, in the late 19th century, it, that shifted somewhat uh, through conscious uh, Meiji government decisions uh, to give it an enhanced sacred status, the so-called divine status, uh, from the late 19th century until 1945. And then since then as a symbol and now as a well-entrenched part of Japan's democracy. The religious functions of the emperor are quite distinct from his constitutional role. Uh, he is in effect the chief Shinto priest. This has not been without controversy in post-war Japan because of the constitution's strict separation between religion and state. Uh, that sought to avoid the perceived excesses of the state Shinto established by the Meiji government. The emperor performs his state functions largely in the public eye, but his religious ones with much less public focus. It is only in the last few years that we've seen uh, television footage of the emperor's visits to the Kyuchu Sanden Shrine, located in the grounds of the imperial palace that houses Shinto deities and the spirits of previous emperors. Arguably, the onerous demands of the religious calendar are one of the reasons for the emperor's abdication. As the emperor was not able to delegate any of those functions, he, as emperor, is essential to ritual. Uh, contrast the British Queen, who, while head of the Church of England, isn't essential to daily religious rituals. So, uh, Notable, too, is the um, imperial family's guardianship of much traditional culture, I could write a book on this and could bore you for the rest of the evening on the subject, but let me give you one example. The Utakai Hajime, or the annual New Year's poetry reading at the palace in January, presided over by the emperor and empress and attended by the imperial family. Six ambassadors are allowed to attend every year, and I was lucky enough to do so in 2013. Poems are composed by each member of the family and by a small group of others selected nationwide, including school children, all to a set theme, uh, that changes each year, and they are chanted aloud. It is a hauntingly beautiful event at which you have on full display a tradition that has been around for about 1,500 years, still going on under the patronage of the imperial family. And it's well rooted in public interest in poetry. Those of you who know Japan will know that five or six million people are involved, ordinary people are actively involved in writing poetry, about four or five percent of the population. But the most prominent, uh, most conspicuous role of the imperial family in recent decades has been, has been that of consoling the Japanese people at times of calamity. As we saw uh, after the 11th of March 2011 earthquake and tsunami, uh, the Emperor, Emperor Akito and Empress Michiko and now Emperor Naruto and Empress Masako have devoted a great deal of time to this. And I think it is this role of the imperial institution with which contemporary Japanese people are now most familiar. I'll just say a bit about the era name, the new era name, drawing almost as much attention as the abdication and the accession of the emperors, Japan has been transfixed by the announcement of the new era name, its meaning and its etymology, and also by a wave of nostalgia as uh, em Emperor Akihito and Empress Michiko carried out their last official duties before the abdication took effect on the 30th of April. Now, era names up until Meiji would change repeatedly under the one emperor, depending on national fortunes and political whims of the time. It is only since 1868 that we see one reign name per emperor. The two characters for Rewa are taken from the prose preface to a group of 36, I think it is, or 34, anyway, th about that, poems about plum blossom from the earliest collection of Japanese language court poetry, the Manyoshu. Not that it's relevant, but I was delighted at the choice because uh, that collection has always been one of my great favourites. And let's not forget that there are two plum trees, not cherry trees, plum trees, planted in the very stark minimalist courtyard of the Imperial Palace. Now, the international coverage of the rain name, the new rain name, was a bit misguided, although it is a complicated story. Much has been made of the choice of the earliest Japanese language poetry collection as the source of the new rain name and not the Chinese classics. I mean, I won't go on for 25 minutes uh, on this, but um, just say a couple of things. It is really the new, the new rain name being taken from the Man Yoshu is really the difference between using Latin or English. 
and does not reflect a geopolitical point. It's, uh, and interestingly, the prose section of the Man Yoshu from which, from which the characters are taken was written in classical Chinese. Uh, that's, um, that's, and only now, in modern editions, appears in uh, classical Japanese form. Some have also criticized the choice of the Man Yoshu because some of its poems were drawn on, during, drawn on for nationalist propaganda prior to 1945. This isn't fair. Uh, great literature can be used but also abused. Uh, the reality is the Man Yoshu is a collection of poetry that was remarkably diverse in content and includes poems authored by very ordinary people, including, for example, border guards pining for home, which managed to make their way into the Imperial Court, collection, court Poetry Collection. So um, on to the actual transition. Uh, we are in Japan for the transition. Uh, uh, I don't obviously have a continued role uh, up there in any official capacity, but was up there on business, and we decided to stay on for the unprecedented 10 days of public holidays that, uh, that marked the occasion. It was interesting for what it showed about modern Japan. A few observations, I think quite uh, notable, were the statements made by the emperor, or now emperor emeritus, on abdication and the new emperor on accession. A commitment to the peace constitution, to their role as symbol of the unity of the Japanese people and to contributing to Japan's international relations. And particularly their strong emphasis on how successive generations will keep striving, of, of emperors will keep striving toward upholding the ideal of the symbol of Japanese, of the unity of a Japanese people. But secondly, the debate about separation of state and religion is still there, including over what parts of the accession ceremonies should be funded by the government. And this will continue to be an uneasy point of friction in Japanese society. Thirdly, and I think most interesting, was the way in which it gave Japanese a prompt to reflect at length on the last 30 years. Everyone I know spoke of where they fitted. Those like me who straddled three eras, Showa, Heisei and Narewa. Those under 30 who for the first time were experiencing a transition. And of course, those few people still alive, you have to be 107 to achieve this, who lived through the tail end of Meiji, Taisho, Showa, Heisei and Naurewa. Several were still well enough to be interviewed on television and to be asked for their impressions. A reminder that the Japanese have pretty well the longest life expectancy in the world. So what does it all mean this, uh, for, for ordinary people? I think certainly Japanese people define themselves in terms of the era in which they were born and grew up. Let me give you an example. People born, say, in Showa 40 will speak of sharing the same musical taste and that'll define their where they are in the world. So it does differ from our habit in the English-speaking world of only retrospectively identifying a period. Where, you know, people would be identified in retrospect as being of the Georgian or the Victorian or the Edwardian eras, but only well after, I think, those reigns had finished. I mean, my grandparents could be called Edwardians because they were adults you know, in, at, at the turn of a century. But they wouldn't have thought themselves that they were Edwardians, whereas people in Japan will see themselves as born and growing up in a particular era. Now, the eras marked the passage of time for the country as well as for individuals. Meiji, 1868 to 1912, was about opening up to and catching up with the West, as well as establishing a form of constitutional government and some aspects of representative democracy. At the same time as developing some imperial ambitions, sadly also an aspect of, one aspect of imitating the West. Uh, Taisho, 1912 to 1926, known for a more liberal spirit and a strengthening of democratic institutions, but still without a universal franchise. Now the first 25 years of Showa, of course, um, as we all know, saw military overreach, loss of civilian control, and a catastrophic war, followed by the Allied occupation the second part of Shaw, the next nearly 40 years, saw Japan accept a new constitution, regain its sovereignty, entrench its democracy, and recover economically. Then Heisei uh, saw the collapse, this is 89 to 2019, saw the collapse of the bubble economy, followed by years of comfortable enough but not dynamic growth, and at the tail end, or the, toward the end, the, with the Abe government, a commitment to revitalization. But we can get too carried away with this. Neither the era name nor the emperors 
determined the evolution of Japan in any of those periods, but they came to be shorthand references to the mood of the time and to reflect Japanese history as it passed. Another observation about the transition, it raised again the question of the succession. Uh, this is a sensitive matter, I'll just say a few things on this. Uh, only males, and only through the male line, the patrilineal line, can uh, inherit the throne. Uh, what that means is the equivalent of Prince Charles can't inherit because his right to the throne is through his mother, uh, let alone a woman in her own right. But opinion, interestingly, opinion polling reveals that close to 80% of a Japanese population support a, wo a woman ascending the throne. And the abdication law that was passed uh, to allow the, um, the now emperor emeritus to abdicate uh, explicitly provides for a discussion of options for uh, considering the future role of women in the imperial family. Whatever happens, it won't happen overnight. It'll be something that'll be discussed inside Japan by Japanese, It'll be step by step. It'll take a number of years, uh, I expect, but I can, I can see a pathway on this one. And moving on, uh, I was um, also struck by the, the joyful atmosphere in Japan. Unlike previous transitions marked by the death of the monarch, there was no sense of mourning as the transition marked an orderly transition through abdication for the first time in 202 years. And for many Japanese, there was a strong sense of nostalgia, as there was for me, uh, as the media covered all the popular cultural shifts of the last 30 years. Those of you who know Japan will know Kohaku Gassen on New Year's Eve, which brings together the popular cultural highlights of the year. And we were treated to highlights of the last 30 years of these <laughs> over about a seven or eight hour program, which um, I was transfixed by. I was <laughs> reliving my youth. <laughs> and I think many Japanese did too. So um, the transition itself doesn't bring with it any big changes. It says a lot about Japan, but it doesn't bring with it itself any big changes. Instead, we see continuity in both Japan's historical imperial tradition and in its post-war constitutional settlement, which have evolved together to mould the institution as it is today. The emphasis placed by the two emperors, uh, one abdicating, one acceding to the throne on their role as symbol, the careful parliamentary deliberations over the abdication law, the way in which the um, successive emperors have strengthened the role of the institution uh, in, as one of consoling the Japanese people at times of disaster, all show how the institution continues to, involve, to evolve flexibly, albeit slowly. To say a bit about broader trends in Japan, um, the new era will see other changes. Uh, Prime Minister Abe will probably step down in 2021 at the end of his third and final term as head of the ruling Liberal Democratic Party, barring yet another change in party rules allowing a fourth three-year term. But the third three-year term was quite hard fought, thought, quite hard fought, so um, we'll see. I think he probably will finish up in 2021, but you can hold me to that uh, when we get there. Um, it's worth dwelling briefly on the last 10 years to examine the changes that have taken place and the, how sustainable they are. Uh, just running through them very quickly, I mean, Japan has firmed up its defence posture in response to the rise of a stronger, often assertive, on occasions aggressive, China. This started before Abe and will continue after. What this, this firming up of its security posture amounts, to, well, it has included constitutional reinterpretation, increased defence expenditure from a very low level, and streamlined national security decision making. Japan still cannot do all that others can on security and defence, but it has more options available to it than it did. In a departure from the past, constitutional reinterpretation that took place in 2015 means Japan can come to the assistance of other countries seeking to defend themselves from um, attack, not just defend itself, but there has to be a threat to Japan at the same time to justify that constitutionally. Now, striking too over this period has been, I think, the quality of Japanese diplomacy, and that's really been Prime Minister Abe's strong suit. He's pretty ably led his country, navigating quite strong geopolitical tides, 
and has deftly managed major power relations with China, the United States, and others. I think he knew before anyone else the value of personal engagement with President Trump, distasteful though that might be. That's my view, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that. Uh, with, um, with China, uh, his government held firm. For example, not conceding any of China's four con conditions for the resumption of high-level dialogue in 2015, but being willing nonetheless to re-engage with China when they were ready. Not a bad model to pursue. Uh, we see now a warming of relations with China, also driven by China's desire to improve relations with its neighbours as its own relations with the United States worsen. Um, uh, I'd also say Prime Minister Abe has been very successful in dealing with each of our recent Prime Ministers, uh, and uh, I can talk more about that if you like, uh, in question time. Uh, and he's also been very successful in strengthening Japan's relations with India. I think he's been over ambitious uh, for the relations with Russia, Japan's relations with Russia. I don't see settlement of the territorial dispute between the two anytime soon, nor a peace treaty. Uh, they, haven't, they still haven't concluded a peace treaty uh, ending World War II between Japan and Russia. Now, um, turning very briefly to the economy, um, most senior Japanese business people will say that the Prime Minister has done better at diplomacy than at economic reform, uh, although his stewardship has been good enough. Now, by modern international standards, uh, and admittedly they're quite low, uh, the Japanese government doesn't have a bad record at economic management, economic reform. Every year there's been one signature economic uh, reform. Significant trade liberalisation, starting with our Australia-Japan Free Trade Agreement in 2014, then the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which then mutated into an acronym I can never remember, the comprehensive anyway, comprehensive something or another, progressive tra trade, uh, TPP. Yes, anyway, it's uh, uh, without the United States. And also EU-Japan free trade agreement. And complementing all of these, and in part deriving from uh, these trade negotiations, uh, Japan has begun the process of reforming its hidebound and, and inwardly focused agricultural sector, forcing it to turn its eyes to the outside world. There have been some improvements in corporate governance, including a greater emphasis on independent directors and a reduction in the interlocking, in the, uh, and a reduction in the infamous interlocking shareholdings that have um, uh, reduced shareholder scrutiny of big Japanese companies. These have gone some way to ameliorating the very clubby atmosphere of Japanese corporate life. There's been some progress on female participation in the workforce, supported by better, childcare, and more importantly, the beginning, the beginning of a discussion on the roles that both parents should have in child rearing, but still a long way to go. And more recently, a more organised program of foreign labour mobility, dare I call it immigration, although that isn't the terminology used by the Japanese government. It's a start. Um, we can criticise Japanese governments that it's taken this long. After all, demography doesn't move quickly, and it's been known since about 1992 that uh, Japan's population would start falling in 2000, and, um, I think it was 2014 or 15 or thereabouts. Uh, notable too is how uh, the government has fostered tourism promotion into Japan that has really driven regional, well, the revitalisation of a number of regional towns. Interestingly here too, it's the regions, it's uh, politicians in the regions, out in rural and regional Japan, uh, reflecting local business views, that have been saying to the Prime Minister and those around him that regional business needs foreign labour to survive because there aren't enough people in the countryside to keep their businesses going. As I said, Mr Abe will likely step down, barring rule changes in his party constitution in 2021. He will continue, though, to be influential. I had the privilege of a number of hours of conversation with him, particularly, but not only, when he was in the wilderness before he returned to prime ministership in late 2012. 
to say two or three things about him. I, I think he's been successful because the Japanese electorate saw him as the right man for the times. Uh, I think it's unlikely that he would have been able to m mount a comeback as prime minister, having served once before in 2006, uh, 2005, 6 mm, yeah. Uh, I, it's unlikely, I think, that he would have been able to mount, mount that comeback if China's economic and military weight hadn't grown so much and if China hadn't adopted a relatively assertive posture toward Japan uh, from 2010 on. The Prime Minister isn't all powerful. He has to persuade his own party and the broader Japanese system as well as the electorate, largely because of the Japanese preference for achieving consensus. But Mr Abe has been more willing than many Prime Ministers of Japan to push change through once he's achieved a critical mass of support rather than waiting for full consensus. And I'd also say he isn't quite the conservative rightist that he's often portrayed as. It's a more complex story. Yes, he is conservative, uh, but he's also very pragmatic. A conservative rightist, rightist would not have entered into agricultural reform, trade liberalisation, let alone foreign labour liberalisation, or use the language that he included in his comprehensive 2015 apology on the 70th anniversary of the end of the war. And I can also say that he's susceptible to influence and persuasion. So I'll finish up by saying a few words on the question of will the achievements of the government be rolled back in the years to come? I think probably not. The strategic and economic changes that have, that, that have taken place in Japan did start before Mr Abe came to power and will continue after. They're driven by necessity. The difference between Mr Abe and his predecessors, though, lies in having the political capital spare to make hard decisions that had eluded previous governments. Just try my hand at a few predictions for the first five to ten years of Dewa. Will the constitution be revised in any meaningful way to uh, unblock the last remaining restrictions on what Japan can do uh, in the security and defence area? On balance, I don't think it will. It'll be a big risk to take to a popular vote. Uh, although I'd say, in, in saying that, I note that the prime minister has said that he wishes to has has said that he wishes to make changes. But I, I, I would say, and uh, again, you can come back to me in a few years uh, and say that I don't think that will happen. But I also predict that the new legislative basis to Japan's security that was negotiated in 2015, which does allow a greater security role, won't be rolled back. Yes, there was vocal opposition at the time, uh, uh, but the secret of the success of the current Japanese government is that the Liberal Democratic Party already with quite diverse views within it on Japan's defence and security policy, is in coalition with the Kormeto, a pacifist party, which delivers lots of votes to lots of votes for LDP candidates. Uh, it's a bit like, well, this probably to be my age to um, understand this, it's a bit like what the DLP used to do for liberal governments in the, the 50s and 60s, uh, delivering dis disciplined votes uh, for, uh, uh, for the government. Together, the LDP and Cormeto, the, the span of their views, if you like, does represent a very broad swathe of Japanese opinion, which suggests that they, what they've been able to agree uh, within the coalition will survive the test of time. Uh, will foreign labour keep flowing in? Well, keeping the economy in good shape will require Japan to sustain, uh, I think, its progress in trade liberalisation, but also in handling its demographic challenges by raising female workforce participation and also permitting foreign labour. The laws of supply and demand mean that foreign labour is entering Japan now. The convenience stores all over Japan, are so many are staffed by people who are from Southeast Asia, South Asia, from China. Uh, it's not a question of whether Japan will accept foreign labour, but how socially inclusive Japan can be uh, in dealing with them. I'm less pessimistic on that front than I used to be. Um, it's interesting, sports had a bit of a role to play in all of this. Um, it may be tokenistic, it may be you know, just, um, but symbols matter. Things like the, the, the composition of a Japanese rugby team, uh, watching Naomi Osaka's success at tennis, show an increased willingness 
by Japan to embrace a more diverse type of Japanese. But it's going to take a lot of adjusting, won't be easy, and I'll predict now that any crime committed by a foreigner will get disproportionate media attention. But Japan, of course, is not alone in that. So um, we can see a bit of that uh, closer to home here in Australia. And will Japan resume its dominant uh, economic role in East Asia? No, I don't think Japan will again be the centre of, of the region's economy. It's been ceding that position to China for some time, but Japan remains a major global economy, key enabler of global economic development through its investment, aid and technology. Its enormous stock of overseas investment alone, which reached over $1.47 trillion in 2017, ensures it continues to wield great influence. Japanese companies still too also have great uh, vast reserves of funds ready for investment both globally and domestically. Uh, they'll follow the returns and in, in where they direct their money and reflect political and economic risk assessment. How much goes abroad will depend on economic growth prospects at home, uh, which will depend in turn on arresting demographic decline and continued economic reform. Abroad, though, it's more complicated. The United States under President Trump is pressuring everyone, including Japan, to invest in the United States. This will affect some corporate investment decisions. The US-China trade war is seeing a fall in the amount of Japanese investment in China as Japanese enterprises, who, have fact who may have factories, uh, facilities in China, are now experiencing tariffs being levied on the product that gets produced in China and exported into the United States. So I bet I am running a bit over time, so just a couple final points. I think one thing that won't change much is Japan's rather challenging strategic circumstances. I mean, the shift in global economic weight, the rise of China and India, has dispersed strategic influence and military power. That makes Japan more anxious about its security including its energy and food security. Japan has not only to grapple with Chinese assertiveness and the threat posed by North Korea, but also with growing US reluctance to exercise global leadership, which under President Trump takes the form of raising doubts about US reliability. Um, I don't think this is going to change. This is going to go on for, for, for quite some time. So. I'll conclude by saying, I was going to say a bit about Australia-Japan relations, but you can ask me something I worked on for 33 years, but, uh, but you can ask me about that in question time if you'd like to. Uh, one final point, though, another thing I think unlikely to change are Japan's relatively high levels of social trust, its low levels of crime, and the quality of Japan's merchandise and service culture. These are three things which stand Japan in a very good stead. So I've cantered through two or three big topics, something for everyone, but quite possibly satisfying nobody. Happy, <laughs> happy to take questions. Thank you, Bruce. So I'm Chris Sainz, for those that don't know me, director of the gallery, and it's a great pleasure to host what I think should be a pretty lively Q&A. We've been set up here to expect that the bridle has been removed and that Bruce is no longer a working diplomat and very, uh, would very much welcome your questions. So can I invite questions from the floor? And we have got a roving mic, I should have mentioned, sorry. Thank you, Mr Miller, for a wonderful presentation. I'm just curious to know more about the discussion about the public funding of the ritual aspect of the handover that you mentioned briefly. And I suppose a follow-on from that is, can you give us a sense of the lifestyle of the imperial family in Japan and their, how, access, how accessible they are to the general public, mm. whether they're subject to the kind of sort of gossip and so forth that we expect from, from our own royal family? Thank you so much. As ambassador, you have a privileged level of access to the imperial family. You're representing your country and you present credentials to the emperor at the imperial palace. You go to four or five events a year at the palace. Uh, in your fourth year, if you last that long, which I did, uh, you get uh, to attend a, a small luncheon with members of the imperial family, the emperor and empress, and uh, two or three members of the family, just 10 of us around the table. Uh, I was sat next to the emperor because I could speak the language. And uh, 
So you do, you do get an insight into them. Now, having said all that, I can't talk to you about any of those conversations. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I can say that um, I was quite struck by um, how affable a family they were, sitting down to lunch together and chatting away with three or four ambassadors floating around. It was like any Japanese family. It was, it was quite charming. Uh, the other part of your question was about how, how they're treated by um, uh, the press. I think there's a greater discipline in the press in Japan, in the mainstream press, in the, the way in which they handle the imperial family. Having said that, the tabloid press, the yellow press, if I can put it that way, the, uh, the shukanshi, are less disciplined and uh, one reads all sorts of things in them. Uh, I would always say to my staff, though, that um, uh, in looking at what the, uh, the shukanshi, these, these, these weekly magazines, have to say, that, and they cover all sorts of things, political gossip, uh, you know, social gossip, all the rest of it, you can only believe about 30% of it. So, so all sorts of things get written, and most of it's not true. I think, was, was there another element to the question? Uh, Oh, the funding, sorry, yes, the funding, the first part of your question. Yes, um, well, it's a technical, well, a technical distinction that matters. There are certain ceremonies that are religious in nature and certain ceremonies like the, the, um, the ascension ceremony or like that are not. Uh, so should the government fund, don't you say, yeah, in October, uh, that's a religious uh, ceremony. I mean, even a member of the imperial family uh, the, the new emperor's younger brother has expressed a view on that publicly that perhaps it shouldn't be funded by the by the national purse. So it is about the separation between uh, state and religion, and that debate will continue to that will continue on because the emperor has both sets of functions: the uh, the public governmental ones, if you like, the state functions, and the more private religious ones. Are there other questions? Uh, Bruce, when we were in Tokyo in 2016-17, yes. on the news almost every night there was a story about Okinawa mm. and the, I'm not sure of the term, the premier or the governor mm. of Okinawa at that time, I think has since died, but was very, mm. very active mm. there. Mm. My question is really, do you think that will continue as an issue and this is an issue about the US base Mm. in Okinawa, that anything will change there or mm. will just be mm. local agitation mm. and mm. Mm. the national government will mm. push that down? Well, um, it's a very complicated story and it, uh, uh, it goes back to the time before US bases, actually, and uh, how Okinawans were, were treated at um, uh, various times. But uh, uh, I, I think that... Um, I mean, the, the, the core of the problem lies in that Japan has been safe for nearly seven, has been secure for nearly 70 years because of the deterrence offered by the presence of US bases in Japan. So all of Japan has benefited from that. However, it is Okinawa that wears the burden of 70% of that military presence. So the burden is much greater there in Okinawa. And then it plays into the uh, the um, the uh, 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 the fact that Okinawans within Japan have had a, a somewhat more distinct history, uh, and uh, uh, and so yeah, it's a yes, it'll continue, I think, for so long as the uh, and it's it, some of the pressure points can be managed. You know, it's it's been far too long that the Stemma Air Base has been sitting there in the middle of a highly um, urban part of Okinawa. That should have been moved years and years ago. Uh, um, uh, yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, exactly, it'll, it'll go on, I, I fear, I, I believe, yeah. Mm. yeah. But you know, the, the nature of defense is changing. Uh, whether you need that number of people physically uh, present in Okinawa or not is another question altogether. But of course, any shift in forces sends a signal that might be misinterpreted about US commitment, particularly um, given where we are right now with President mm. Trump. Mm. G'day. Uh, thank you very much for coming to speak to us tonight. Very enlightening uh, chat. 
Now, obviously, Japan and Australia enjoy quite a warm relationship. Mm. Um, however, quad notwithstanding that alliance structure, yes, this is a defence question, sorry, mm. more along those lines to mix it up a little bit. Mm. Um, I'm looking along the lines of, in your opinion, um, would Australia pursuing a closer defence relationship with Japan in the uh, near to medium term future mm. be a, a logical step for Australia considering the... Um, the um, unstable, shall we say, mm. geopolitical situation of both countries? Mm. Well, I think the answer is a resounding yes. Uh, we share an awful lot in common, and it's more than yes, we have been for about 15 years uh, uh, strengthening that relationship, uh, doing all sorts of things together, whether it be, um, you know, joint exercises, whether it be uh, logistics agreements that allow us to do more thing, do things more efficiently and smoothly together. When I say things, it can be anything. And you know, most 95% of the time, these new defence agreements facilitate humanitarian assistance and, defense, and uh, disaster uh, relief, HADR. Uh, that's how you get... Let me give you an example. In 2011, when we sent assistance to Japan, uh, we sent two of our um, C-17s, our big... Um, uh, our, um, from our Air Force uh, to assist in relief uh, in Japan after the earthquake and tsunami. And they were actually a vital contribution to what happened, but there was no legal framework that allowed them to be sent because we didn't have a proper defence agreement that allowed the access of defence assets readily to Japan. Uh, it got in under a one-off sort of a thing, but nonetheless, those sort of things really matter. Now, they also matter if something awful happened in the region as well for us to be able to work together smoothly. And they send a signal about how two democracies, liberal democracies like Australia and Japan, are willing to work together in this way, both allies of the United States and both wanting to contribute to, you know, stability in the region. Uh, I haven't forfend that there ever be a war, but actually strengthening those sort of relationships actually makes it less likely that there'll be conflict rather than more likely. Any further questions? Um, thank you for your talk today. Um, I just had a question about what sort of steps Japan would have to take in order to implement more foreign workers um, inside of Japan. Mm. Because as you said before, there is some sort of presence of foreign workers in Japan, but these are somewhat restricted to people in convenience stores, mm. which are somewhat of like a lower sort of... Um, mm, sure. And also mm. there's some sort of need of... Um, workers in regional areas, specifically yeah. agriculture. Yeah. 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 Um, and there have been some people that have talked about how people in high positions, such as um, businesses, often feel treated as temporary workers, much yeah. m okay. far less than permanent sure. workers. Sure. So what should um, this current prime minister and the upcoming prime minister be working on in order mm. to help strengthen ties in order mm. to improve? Well, I think you probably, um, in my uh, sort of non-analytical way, I gave you too many anecdotes, I think, and my reference to convenience stores is but one example of uh, how uh, foreign labour has been flowing into Japan anyway. There have been provisions for some years under Japan's bilateral uh, trade agreements with Southeast Asian countries uh, to bring in um, uh, care workers, hospital, you know, nursing, nurses, care workers, uh, uh, those sort of uh, uh, types of qualifications, those sorts of occupations. So, and they've been flowing in, but it's a bit, it's been a bit challenging because the uh, the exam they're required to learn 2,500 kanji before they can assist in helping granny out of the bath, which is uh, which is uh, you know it's, it's insane. If you if you're going to be a nurse, yes, you have to be able to read because you're prescribing medicines, but if you're a care worker, aged care worker, it's less less necessary. Mm -hmm. Now, what the government has done, actually, in very recent years is to, uh, to alleviate that, to actually make it easier for those sorts of occupations to come in. Uh, and we're seeing more and more of that. The most recent, legal, most recent law that's gone through is going to systematise that and, uh, and increase the numbers further. I think it's, it's 250,000 a year, I think something like that is what, is what is proposed, which is a big increase. Uh, it's not going to be enough to make up the dem demographic deficit. And you're right to point to the problems of acceptance. I mean, 
that happens. It happens in every society. And I remember a number of years ago um, making the point to senior Japanese that the best way to implement this sort of a program is to choose the people you want to come to Japan through a, an orderly program of, um, I didn't use the word immigration, but a, you know, a foreign labor program, and, uh, and, uh, and, and give them some sense of stake in the country, not just as temporary one, two, three year workers. Now, it's only halfway, they, haven't, they don't come in for forever, they don't come as migrants, they come for periods of time. But those are more easily converted over into a, a longer stay than was the case previously. So those, that tweaking of a system is making a difference to uh, whether people can stay for the, and then bring their families in due course as well. But still a long way to go. Uh, I think, um, but I, 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 the company that I'm, I'm involved, one of the companies I'm involved with now, uh, the Daiichi Life Group of Japan, has a lot of foreign, foreigners coming in and working in it now. In quite, you know, in quite senior positions, and uh, it's a company that's only gone international the last ten years or so. So there's a now it's at the forefront, if you like, uh, but uh, uh, they're not all doing that. But it's a big company which is taking in people uh, at the lateral level, not just at 22 out of Japanese universities, uh, and uh, and you know increasing uh, the numbers of foreigners working normally inside a big Japanese company. So it's incremental, it's slow. Uh, but it's happening. Just, I think uh, we're close to our last question, I think. So I'm, I'm talking too much for each <coughs> you're question. Not. You're also. absolutely not. <laughs> um, thank ahead. you for your presentation. Since you've mentioned that Prime Minister Abe's policy is likely to continue beyond his term mm. uh, within the next two years, would you be able to speculate on his potential successes? I know it might be premature at this stage, <laughs> but we've heard a lot about... Kono and Kishida and maybe Koizumi Shinjiro and even Suga recently. I know it's a speculative question, but you know, if, you, if you'd accept. Ask the Consul General. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Um, um, all those names you mentioned are undoubtedly possible. As time passes, though, it's uh, less likely that the, um, uh, the older ones in that group, I mean, We'll get it, Kishida san and the like, although who knows, who knows. Um, uh, Koizumi Shinjiro is still young, he's got plenty of time, he's very capable, but he's got plenty of time. Um, who would I put my money on? I would put my money on Suga san, actually, but, uh, but you know, you, you um, like Japanese are always used to ask me when I was ambassador who the next. Prime Minister of Australia was going to be. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> so, 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 one of the joys of not being ambassador anymore is not having to explain um, what had just happened overnight in Canberra <laughs> to a bemused Japanese government. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you. I think we will uh, wrap up questions. It's been, I'll take that. Thank you, Bruce. Um, it's been a great response, thank you, um, to Bruce's presentation this evening. I think that he called it a canter, but it was so rich with information uh, in so many um, areas of Japan's history, not only its imperial history, but also its contemporary economy and its contemporary culture and contemporary life. And I think that that only really comes from 40 years of that lived experience that you described at one point. Um, and it was just great that we had the benefit and I think um, the privilege of you sharing that information so warmly and informally with us tonight. Um, it was um, post-diplomacy rather than academia that you were coming from and I, I felt for one that I learned an enormous amount about imperial tradition that I think um, I certainly had no idea of and it was interesting when you talked about what some 200 years since the last abdication and talked about there was no period of mourning on this occasion, but rather 10, 10 days of celebration. Wouldn't we all wish for that when the Governor General was um, brought into power? But it was one of those things that makes you say, well, what will happen next? What will happen in the later period of the life of the current emperor? Will that be seen as a, an orderly transition that ought to be made again in a more contemporary manner? I guess even recently the popes have discovered that it's possible to make that transition and have a kind of emeritus former pope still living. Who would have thought 
that would have occurred. So it's been really interesting to hear your uh, speculations about the future. I don't think the questions were hard enough. I think you were opening us up to invite lots of commentary about things, but it was just one or two were, one or two were but you're really such a generous uh, presentation tonight, Bruce, and on behalf of Perspectives Asia, um, on, on behalf of the Griffith Asia Institute and the gallery, I'd just like to present you with a token of our very warm appreciation for your presentation. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.